and greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV radio and podcast alongside Todd Erzin. I am Steve Dace and I'm alongside Aaron McIntyre too. You thought I was going to forget you, didn't you? Yeah, I didn't really think at all. Well. Kind of gets you far in life, as I found. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. I mean, we were, we were originally going to call the show The Peter Principle, but we thought that'd just be too obvious. So we went with the Steve Day Show instead. You can't embarrass me. I won't think at all. Yes. Indeed. Actually, I did almost forget to mention Aaron, but uh, now I kind of wish that I would have just followed through on that. <laughs> Joke's on you. There's not a single thing going on up here. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure they're very proud, uh, especially right now, that our show each day is brought to you by our friends at First Cup Coffee Company. Um, and I'm sure they're very proud to count Aaron as a customer. Just maybe not right now. Uh, if you want to try some outstanding uh, coffee, uh, a flavor for every freedom-loving American from some outstanding patriots that share the same values you do. They put the roast on date on every bag, ship within days of being roasted as well. Go to firstcup.com, use the code DACE, save an additional 10% off your order if you do that. And if you subscribe, you get another additional 10% for the life of your subscription. Firstcup.com, promo code DACE. That's firstcup.com, promo code DACE. Uh, coming up on today's show, uh, we are going to spend an hour next hour on idolatry or not. And we have a, a, a summation. What was this like? Five hours of testimony about a week ago in the United States Senate hosted by Senator Ron Johnson of Wisconsin. His office was kind enough to distill it down to about 15 minutes. We are going to show you the entirety of that compilation. We think everybody needs to see this. And so we're going to show you the entirety of that uh, compilation. And, um, and then we're going to spend the, next, uh, the rest of the hour reacting to it. Because I think there are some important questions that need to be asked in, in light of the information that is given there. Both with what's happening in the country right now, but then what may happen in the future. So we're going to get into that coming up in the next hour of the show. At the bottom of this hour... Um, we're going to talk to a, a pro-life father uh, and his attorney who are facing persecution from the Biden regime via the so-called FACE Act. We'll get into that at the bottom of the hour. But first, today obviously is a very big day, the release of my new book. It is book two in my trilogy of children's books on America's Christian heritage. Why Easter? Jesus died for us so we can live forever. Um, if you want to get your copy of the book today, today's the day. It is released nationwide today. Just go to Amazon.com and order your copy today. Um, I think it would be, if you don't mind me saying so, excellent to read in libraries, particularly Christian school libraries across the country, uh, because the, the, the gospel is not just fully explained to small children in a way that they can understand in the book, but it also indicates how that same gospel inspired the country that they were born into. So no gospel, no, no country. No country, no gospel. Uh, these two things are intertwined together. Um, and um, if you want to get a copy of the book, um, you can do so at Amazon.com. Also, if you want to get a signed copy, PremierCollectibles.com slash Easter is where you can go. PremierCollectibles.com slash Easter. And we are doing tomorrow something we've not done for one of my books before, so we'll see how it's going to go. Uh, tomorrow we're doing a live virtual signing uh, where you can chime in if you want to join the chat and ask questions. Uh, this is going to happen uh, tomorrow at livesigning.com slash whyeaster. Livesigning.com slash whyeaster. This is going to be at 4 o'clock Eastern tomorrow. It'll last about 30 minutes or so. Livesigning.com slash whyeaster. We have a limited amount of books that we're going to make available there where I will personalize how you would like me to sign it. So to you, to a loved one, um, a, a dedication to somebody, however you'd like me to sign it within reason, of course. I mean, obscenity rules apply. 
should go without saying. All right. But uh, uh, live signing.com slash why Easter. Hope to see a bunch of you there tomorrow, four o'clock Eastern. If you want to, if you want to take part in that uh, process tomorrow, but the book is available now at amazon.com. Why Easter Jesus died for us so that we can live forever. And we did very well in pre-sales with this book. The Thanksgiving book performed very well. I think this book actually is even better in my opinion. So thank you to all of you that have uh, been supportive of this project. And just to give you guys again, kind of the genesis of this after Rush Limbaugh passed away, my publisher came to me and said, Hey, you know, what do you think about doing, um, you know, picking up where Rush left off and doing a series of books for kids on American history, like he did with his Rush Revere books. And I'm like, man, I, I can't, I can't fit in those moccasins for a day. But if you allow me to do something similar yet unique, which is if, if you want to do a series on America's Christian heritage for kids, I might be interested. To my surprise, the publishers said yes. So this is book two in a trilogy. Uh, we will release the third one in 2026 for America's 250th uh, birthday titled Why Independence Day. But Why Easter is out now, if you want to get your copy. And with that, here is Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by a short-lived victory. Over the weekend, the U.S. Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals cleared the path for the implementation of a Texas law mired in legal purgatory to actually take effect. The law allows Texas to imprison illegals if they cross over into the United States. And it's gone. Because last night, the Biden administration appealed the circuit court's ruling to the Supreme Court, basically going to the highest court in the land to argue against Texas doing the job they should be doing, meaning that Texas law is still frozen. This comes as news that the Biden administration has admitted now they flew flew over 300,000 illegals into the U.S. in 2023 alone in order to reduce the numbers coming across the southern border. In the aftermath of the Alabama Supreme Court's decision that said human embryos are indeed human beings, Republican State Representative Terry Collins has introduced a bill designed to protect in vitro fertilization practices. Listen to this exchange in the Alabama State House between her and another lawmaker. This bill would provide civil and criminal immunity or death or death criminal immunity or death or damage to an embryo to any individual or entity when providing or receiving goods or services related to in vitro fertilization. So in Alabama, for all intents and purposes, life begins at conception and according to our constitution, those embryos have a right to life. Wouldn't you agree to that? Yes or no? <laughs> but we also know that in those same fertility treatments, embryos are discarded and embryos are destroyed. The immunity that we're providing here is limited so they can do that. Isn't that correct? Generally, yes. Yikes. Meanwhile, in France. <laughs> Those are the sights and sounds of baby-killing activists partying after the French parliament overwhelmingly voted to enshrine the right to murder babies into that country's constitution. The move was a reaction to the U.S. Supreme Court's overturning of Roe v. Wade. France bans at-will baby murder after 14 weeks, by the way. Last night, CBS Late Show host Stephen Colbert welcomed the World Economic Forum's resident anti-human philosopher Yuval Noah Harari onto his show. And here's one of the questions, I guess, he asked. I'm not that worried about AI. I just, I just doesn't get my blood going to get worried about AI. I think of some positive aspects of it. I mean, I've seen how humans have handled history, and not great. Mm. And and so I'm ready for the you know big machines that make big decisions, programmed by fellows with compassion and vision. You know, <laughs> I, I, I'm ready for the machines to tell us what to do. Mm -hmm. Are you? Uh, not really. It's. <laughs> It's extremely dangerous, Why is it dangerous to give our though? power to something we don't understand. But they're just extensions of us. I mean, no, they're, they're not. We, yes, they are. We made them. They're us. Learning Chinese today, today's phrase is, how is it possible to be more anti-human than Yuval Harari?
。怎么可能比尤瓦尔赫拉利更反人类呢 ？The assistant undersecretary for the Department of Veterans Affairs, a woman named Rima Ann Nelson, sent out this memo a few days ago, insisting all VA facilities across the country remove this iconic photograph from Times Square on VJ Day, depicting that sailor sweeping a woman off her feet and kissing her. Nelson says the image depicts a non-consensual kiss, and pictures depicting such things are very bad. VA Secretary Dennis McDonough came out today and said the image is not banned, but didn't say why his employee apparently went rogue with that memo. This is Victor I. Cesares, who describes himself as a queer indigenous playwright who is engaging in a protest during which he refuses to take his daily HIV medicine until the Broadway theater he works for officially condemns Israel. Stop! Don't come back. And finally, beloved Philadelphia Eagles center Jason Kelsey formally announced his retirement yesterday during his farewell address to the media and the fans. He discussed what his real priorities are in life. Also, given me three beautiful girls and a life that increasingly brings me more fulfillment off the field than it does on. We've, we've had a great run, Kai. I am a product of my upbringing. I think one of the best things a person can be in this world is a father. A father who is present, loving. Devoted just may be the greatest gift a child could ask for in our society, and I have a damn good one. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's montage brought to you by our friends over at Birch Gold. Financial experts thought we were in the clear. They were anticipating around a half dozen rate cuts by the Fed this year. Then the inflation data came out higher than expected. Again, Fens, this is not going away, and it can't. The U.S. is $34 trillion in the hole. Is that bad? If we keep printing money, we'll keep pushing prices higher and higher with more and more inflation. So you can either bury your head in the sand or do something about it. Diversify a portion of your savings into gold with Birch Gold Group. Gold is your hedge against inflation and Birch Gold makes it easy to own it. They'll help you convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax sheltered IRA in gold and you don't even have to pay a penny out of pocket. Text Steve to 989-898. Text Steve to 989-898 and get your free info kit on gold. And then you can talk to a precious metals specialist on how to protect your savings from persistent inflation with gold. Text Steve to 989-898 now. In today's overtime, which is coming up after the show, we'll record it for Blaze TV subscribers so it can be uploaded later today at blazetv.com slash days. I put out a Twitter poll. It's our most voted upon Twitter poll so far this year based on the prediction that I made during Friday's day group that Tulsi Gabbard would be Donald Trump's running mate. And we asked people if they would approve or disapprove of that choice. We have those results. And then we will discuss them today in the overtime for Blaze TV subscribers. If you'd like to become one, that's also where you can go to become one today. BlazeTV.com slash Dace. That's BlazeTV.com slash Dace. So to Aaron's montage, we go. <coughs> Excuse me. Guys, I have to tell you, I didn't have... I didn't have... I think I agree with Yuval Harari on my bingo card for 2024. I, I, it's something. I, I, I can understand why yet another <clears throat> trademark devout Catholic uh, and Stephen Colbert Bing. Uh, is anxious. <laughs> nice. Is anxious to give himself over to something transcendent. He he's actually being consistent with his worldview. He's he is seeking transcendency. Now, the transcendency he's seeking is idolatry. But those are always our choices, right? It's it's the real thing, or it's you know, it's idolatry. But he's at least, while excommunicating himself, he is he is at least seeking a substitute form of transcendence, and that is very well defined here as idolatry he wants to be guided he wants to be led he, he in, a, in a way what Stephen Colbert is saying in that clip 
is a mirror image. Now it's a, you know, a mirror image is your reflection in reverse back at you. It is a mirror image of what Paul says in the New Testament that we will all be a slave to something. Either we'll be in bondage to our sin in this world or we'll be, you know, we'll be in bondage to our Savior. But no one escapes bondage. Colbert is actually acknowledging this. Now, you know, he's pulling the buckwheat here and working Penub in all the wrong haces. But he's at least pursuing transcendence. Albeit an idolatrous form. Explain to me... From a worldview perspective, gentlemen, you have all Harari's perspective. Because that one to me seems to be in opposition to the worldview that he has communicated many times over. I mean, this is the most quote unquote small g godlike thing we could do. Create knowledge in our own image. Imbue a system with our own with our own knowledge and give it dominion. That's the most godlike thing we could do, demonically speaking, of course. So I, I get why I get why Stephen Colbert wants to scratch that itch. I don't understand why Yuval Harari is not willing to do the same here. Anybody have any theories on that? Uh, well, I think Yuval Harari is evil, but I think on this issue he's just more. Doesn't mean he can't be honest about certain certain things. He's just right. Like you, you have no idea what happens to this. I mean, and you did, this is a direct extension. Honestly, it, it, I don't know if Yuval Harari is a sports fan, but perhaps he's seen how instant replay has turned out because this is a ex- um, it's Colbert's thing. What? No, it's not. It's just an extension of us. So is instant replay. You can't even get that right. I, I, I really, I don't think the math is that hard on this. It doesn't mean Yuval Harari is not an utterly wicked nut job, but the math is actually pretty simple on this, and I think he's just seeing it. See, I, I'm not totally sure this is in opposition to Yuval Noah Harari's worldview. Uh, and if he's coming at this from, I, I'm not sure what specific AI, artificial intelligence, they're talking about, but Yuval Noah, Noah Harari doesn't want people going to AI for answers. He wants people going to him for answers. He wants to control. He wants to be the one controlling people, not the machine. Now, what I do not understand, though, is that he seemingly seemingly is unaware that the very people who line up with his worldview are the ones programming most AI machines in the world right now. So I I don't really get that. But yeah, there, there there is that little disconnect but I think this is just a visceral gut level reaction to no, you pee on. Don't ask the machine to be God. I am. I, I want to be the most. High. I think that's kind of where he's coming from in that clip. I can see that was the one theory that I had. What you articulated, Aaron, is that he sees the machines as competition yeah. Yeah. for his own dominion. But again, I I actually, if we're going to be consistent in our worldview, I. And still I can understand more where Colbert is coming from because he is admitting that we made these things, we created these things in our image. They are in, they, they bear our mark. They're our image makers. That's the argument he's making. Um, we imbued them with our, with our knowledge or at least a, a portion of it. You know, machines can't create with their hands like we can. They cannot procreate with an egg and a seed like we can. He's a- so they're limited in, in, in what they can do in mirroring us, similar to how we are limited in what we can do in mirroring God, but they bear our mark nevertheless. So are we saying Yuval Harari is basically just anti-transcendence, period? He's just 100% yeah. materialist. Is that all we're Co- saying? Correct. And I think actually Stephen Colbert is, is the one being inconsistent because mm. he heard there, uh, you heard him say there, um, I look back at how humans have handled things over uh, over history and it's not good. He said yeah. not good. And then at the end, he's wanting extensions of humans to be the ones that there are you making go. decisions. Yes. So. That's but that's, in, but that's impossible. That's impossible once you abandon the plumb line that Colbert has. You're going to end up exactly in the same place progressives always end up, 
which yeah. is um, human Government. nature is basically good, but we can't trust humans to make their own decisions yeah. at the same time. Yeah, okay? it's the Bernie yes. Sanders, it's the <clears throat> John Oliver, who is a great entertainer, or at least was anyway, when he first started on HBO. It's the same argument you, you hear from those types all, all, all the time. Bernie Sanders of 26 to 2015, 2016, even in 2020, railing against corruption in corporatism, railing against corruption in government, saying government created these problems, and some of them are legitimate problems. Some of them are le- legit complaints mm-hmm. against cronyism. Government created all these problems, therefore, we need more government. That's the same place. It's just an extension yeah. of that. Incoherence. Yeah, and on the Yavari side, when I say it's pretty simple, he's, he's, look at what, if you, either the programmers who are progressives do what they've done currently with AI, and it just is stupid, or they actually program it legit, and Yuval Harari knows if it's legit, that Thanos snap comes for me too. That's why he wants to control this thing. I'm not going to, it's the plebs who are going on, not me. But if you just let the AI do it, it's, it is so, Thanos. So it's you're just, saying, you're saying in this conversation, Yuval Harari is Richard Dawkins, basically, or Sam Harris. And, um, and Stephen Colbert is the one who um, wanted Christianity removed from the centerpiece of the public square with the intent of, of replacing it with another religion where the Dawkins and Harris crowd didn't want Christianity replaced with any other religion other than a, a law unto themselves, I essentially. Think some of that in there. And so this is how you end up with Sam Harris and Ben Affleck on, remember that clip during yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. the uh, the uh, Iraq war where Sam Harris and Ben Affleck argued over Islam on real time with Bill Maher. You remember that? Mm-hmm. All right. And Bill, Ben Affleck basically simped for Islam and Richard Dawkins was like, have you ever read the Quran? You even know what these people say and think, you know? So, Okay. Then, if we put this conversation in an eschatological sense, what it seems to me what we are also saying is, um, you know, let's put this in a left behind, a specifically left behind context to draw my analogy. Yuval Harari is the guy at the UN that Nikolai Carpathia eventually turns on and shoots right there in the Security Council. Okay. Um, he's a useful idiot, was of no use to him anymore. Stephen Colbert is the one that literally goes out there and can't wait to take the mark. Is that kind of what we're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know about the former, but I definitely know about the latter is correct. I'm not as familiar. I haven't read the book, so. So Harari basically says, I'm a law unto myself. Why are we having this conversation? Because folks, you were just given a very rare glimpse into the mind's eye of the spirit of the age by two people who have two of the, in in Colbert's case, one of the largest, and in the case of Ferrari, one of the most influential platforms the spirit of the age has provided anyone in the world. And on something that should have, at least based on our surface understanding of what we're up against, should have united them. You saw each of them express completely contradictory views. So I, I don't know what you guys think, but I think it is very worthwhile to be able to take advantage of that level of that. That wasn't, that's not the view. The view isn't recon. The The view is a caricature of the spirit of the age. I mean, the, the, the stuff like the view is the equivalent of when nefarious looks at James in the movie and says, we even come up with that many guys. Sometimes you guys just amaze even us. I mean, the, the view is just, you know, human nature, pure hundred uh, percent proof estrogen with no complementarian um, guidepost whatsoever, just unleashed. And it's just random and it's just irregular. And it's, it, there's, there's it's sound and fury signifying nothing what you see there is is you in, in that clip you see two men who i think each fancy themselves whether that's true or not but each fancy themselves the serious part of the serious wing of this and i think it is fascinating to see where they diverge is that something we can exploit to our advantage well, yes. Because divide and conquer is the oldest strategy. Can we? Yes. Can we? No. Can we exploit that in some way? Yes and no. I mean, yes. If we had 
a team that was interested in doing so. That The problem is we don't have a team that's interested in doing so. Well, that, that's an answer to every time I ask if you can take advantage of this. I mean, I, I have someone whose opinion I hold in very high regard, has done get out the vote successfully on the right in the last several election cycles, knows what they're doing. And, you know, I asked him today, because I, 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 I'm going to now, I owe, now I owe 30 bucks, remind me. I saw a po- Fox News put out a poll yesterday that showed Donald Trump is winning the election by six points. Okay. But it showed he's also losing independence by eight points. No, he's not. That's not happening. It's mathematically impossible. Can't occur. Can't, it can't, not that it won't, it cannot. Like two plus two cannot be five. Three plus three cannot be 12. It just, it cannot happen. It doesn't, it's mathematically impossible. So I sent this to this birdie of mine and that got into a broader conversation because he's beginning to do voter outreach for the general election. And he said to me, he goes, I think Trump can win if they raise a ton of money, build a legitimate national turnout operation. That's code for ballot harvesting. And, um, and they target um, low propensity voters, meaning people that aren't likely to vote a lot, but show up in polls that they're pissed off about how things are going, but then don't vote. Or, you know, what is it, something like 30% of evangelicals, even as much as we dominate elections, like 30% of evangelicals vote or something, maybe it's 40. And, and my response back to him was, so your, your, your analysis is to do the exact opposite of how the Republican Party has been constructed and behaved over the last few cycles. <laughs> that's, what, that's what we got to do, just do the exact opposite. He's like, yeah, pretty much. Okay, so this is a, any time we were to ask a question about how to take advantage of something, we're going to be restricted by the lack of movement. We don't have a movement. We have an industry. We have a, a random assortment of serious thinkers who are not in many places strategically aligned that are surrounded by grifters and opportunists who are, okay? Um, and so we don't really have a serious movement. We could give your answer yeah. on virtually any strategic question we would ask, yeah. okay? But let's assume that we did for just a second. Could we, could we split the enemy divide the enemy could we turn the edomites and philistines against each other based on that conversation well now we're at the next problem most of the people watching that have no idea before the seeing him that who yuval harari is or what the world economic forum is and then most a lot of people including people on the right if they really were honest with themselves would actually agree with colbert because you know what he's talking about. He's talking about that. That would be comfortable. Let's just put this on automatic pilot. That's what everybody wants, Steve. And what is it, Aaron? It's about five minutes from uh, uh, the Terminator. To, yeah. what, it's five minutes from Skynet to Wally, essentially. Yeah. Okay. You know, but they're, they're the same path. You just take a, you know, they're, they're a different cul-de-sac, basically. That's what Todd is saying. Yeah. I, I don't think you can turn them against each, each other because they're ultimately on the same side. What's completely missing from any of Yuval Noah Harari's lectures, from any of the mental math, if there isn't going on in uh, Stephen Colbert's brain, what's missing from all of that is actual true foundational transcendence that's that's what's missing so as long as that's missing you can try to play uh, off of one another all you want but ultimately they are on the same side this is what we were kind of talking about um, or at least a, a spiritual version of what we were talking about yesterday in the overtime which i thought it was you can, you can go check out um uh, by yourself there is no in between here there's no in between no. They're trying. Colbert, to some to some degree, is trying to be non-binary in a binary system. There is either, uh, well, as you put it, Steve. There's either Christ or chaos. Mm-hmm. They're on the side of chaos. Is it too simplistic to say Harari is a communist or a Marxist, and which rejects transcendence, and Colbert is a Western progressive? which wants a redefinition of it. I don't think that's too simplistic. I'm, I'm certain of that with Colbert. Colbert, it's a, Yuval Harari, it's a start, but I'm, I'm not certain totally. 
what's going on there. And then the follow-up question is, which of those two groups would kill more people if yeah, given no, the power? And the answer is yes. Yes. More in a moment. Hey, when you absolutely positively have to buy or sell a home, and let's face it, sometimes you just got to go. And I think there's going to be more and more people as we head into spring and summer that are going to make that decision with this inventory. We've been sitting on this glut of homes over the last couple of years. And that means you need to make sure you do so with a real estate agent that you can trust. Where would you find one? Well, it can be a lot of work to find one of those. And that's why you want to make sure you get lined up with one of the best agents in your area, a top seller, someone who knows the lay of the land, knows what best practices are, can help get you in your real estate journey to where you ultimately want to go, whether you're moving somewhere within your hood or to a totally different neighborhood, maybe even a totally different part of the country. Where would you go? Well, go here realestateagentsitrust.com. The name says it all. Uh, They'll hook you up with that kind of an agent. And a lot of times it's an agent that's from right here in our Blaze audience. So they have a a lot of the same interest and values that you do. realestateagentsitrust.com. Again, the name says it all. realestateagentsitrust.com. That's realestateagentsitrust.com. I'm endeavoring to get our guests back on. Our Skype device just completely crashed right before we went on. I right, always well, love that. Hopefully we can make that happen. You and I, Todd, just let, let's put a, a f- finishing touch yeah. in the conversation we were just having because you and I came to a realization discussing this further during the break that we then looked at each other and said, man, wish we would have thought of that while we were still on the air, right? When Stephen Colbert says... I am fine in trusting history to the or the future to the machines because humans haven't been so good with it throughout history. Um why is he why is he a progressive? Yeah. This is a little bit like I I can't remember who who was the big name in conservative media that went on Joe Rogan and claimed to be a Christian but said they they didn't really have a position on the resurrection I I can't remember who that was it was a it was a huge name but I can't remember who that was I mean listen you don't have to believe in the resurrection no one's making you but if you don't believe in the resurrection guess what you're not a Christian you're not a Christian I mean you're just not doesn't mean, did I say you were an awful person no did I say you were terrible no, no but you're not what. A Christian. Yeah, because what's the fundamental inv- event in Christianity? Uh, the the resurrection. resurrection. Without 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 this event, uh, without blank event, there is no Christianity. Which event would that be? The resurrection. So if you reject that, you're not one. How in the world is Stephen Colbert a progressive if he doesn't believe that human beings have done great with history and we're getting, I see, that we're getting even better? How is he any kind of a progressive at all? Yeah, and his whole side of the church argument, and it, it's... It, it's within it's why the protestant uh churches have increasingly become okay you we, we need to be more bottom up less top down well i mean what if you if you if you want the reins that you're as a humanist yeah you're get you're giving it all up do you even erasmus bro uh, i mean I, that would be my point what you're saying so you want is, you want more humans this is why from the beginning when I heard this thing, it's like I, I'm i still totally confused what the modus operandi is of Yuval Harari and the WEF because it's dark and shadowy and nebul. I mean, they say very honestly the, what their opinion, but where does this go? The, but the chaos of Colbert is just so clear to me. That, like, what, you're just... you. You make no sense. No. Ever. But that's why I think that video was instructed because we got a chance to see their yeah. worldview doing math, doing the, their own math, and their own math does not add up. Well, you mentioned the term dark and shadowy. Um, that's where we want to go next. Uh, we, are, we are joined by Stephen Crampton. He's the senior counsel for the Thomas More Legal Society. Paul Vaughn is a pro-life advocate. Uh, currently being persecuted, I'm sorry, uh, prosecuted uh, by the Biden uh, administration. They both join us now here on the Steve Day Show. Gentlemen, it is a pleasure to have each of you with us. Welcome to the program. Thanks for having us. Paul, I want to start with you. Just Thanks, to, just tell us who you are and your story. Yeah, well, I'm just uh, an average Christian trying to uh, 
uh, engage in the world that God placed me in. And, uh, you know, I'm president of Personhood Tennessee, part of the Personhood Alliance nationally. And we did uh, sidewalk counseling as part of our ministry and outreach, uh, in addition to running a business here in Middle Tennessee and, you know, raising 11 children. Uh, that's just, that's, that's where it all starts. And on the, uh, the day in question, the reason I'm on the FBI and the DOJ's uh, radar and now in their, uh, in their guilty books is because of an event in March of 21, uh, where we did my, our team engage in sidewalk counseling inside a public building in the hallways and reached out to talk to a few moms and try to uh, you know, give them an opportunity to, to save their baby, let them know there are options to adopt or, uh, or even have help and financial aid and things like that. And so that's that's how it all started. And again, you said you were on a public sidewalk on public grounds. A, yeah. So in a public building it's a multi-tenant building. And uh, so we were in the hallway of a multi-tenant building. How many times have you done this before over the years, Paul? Oh, uh, off and on our you know last 20 or 30 years. Uh, we've been on sidewalks and then. Uh, you know, at these places uh, off and on, and just different seasons of life, right? We only recently, in the last few years uh, prior to this event, uh, started on sidewalk counseling training classes and training up churches and taking people out on the streets to go and, uh, and minister. Okay. You buried the lead there, brother. Okay, so uh, you were, <laughs> you're out there just doing random acts of Christianity, but now you're trying to do catechesis and disciple things and turn that mushroom, that mustard seed into a mushroom cloud. So now you're on their radar. That's basically what you just told us. It's very, very true. Yeah. All right, let's bring in Stephen Crampton from the Thomas More Society. So this, this, is, this stems from Stephen, the FACE Act. Tell us what that is stands for Freedom of Access to Clinic Entrances Act, passed in 1994 under the Clinton administration in the wake of the Operation Rescue kind of zenith. Steve, you may remember those mm -hmm. days. The uh, Senate report records some 6,000 clinic, they called them blockades. They were really just sit-ins, right? And then they had an assortment of, uh, they had a few clinic bombings, one murder and so forth. And they cobbled this thing together over a period of 17 years of data and made the case that, gee, it was overwhelming the states. So we have to step in as a federal government in order to protect this precious right to abortion. So they enact this thing that prohibits acts of force, threats of force, or what the heart of it is, I believe, physical obstruction. In other words, sit-ins are no longer treated as a little minor uh, local uh, violation of, say, trespass laws, but instead now categorized as a federal offense, bringing the weight of the federal government to bear, as we saw in Paul's case. And by the way, Steve, let me just say with regard to the time frame, as we uh, meet right here, it is exactly three years to the day after this event occurred. And in Tennessee now, as you know, abortion is a felony. Mm -hmm. The clinic where this occurred no longer exists because they can't uh, parse out uh, surgical abortions. So it's really a, a uh, mess of a situation when you look at it in that context. So, Stephen, we have a 30-year-old statute, and your client has engaged in similar-like behavior for many, many years and was never targeted via this statute, even throughout the entirety of the Obama era. No one came after him with this statute, okay? It is, it, it, and it's in protest yes. of a practice that is against the law in the state in which That's he right. lives, okay? Correct? Yes. All right. Um, and then on top yes. of that, um, the clinic in which this, in which uh, was attempting to uh, kill this child isn't even open anymore, right? Right. Uh, okay. How is this just not an obvious persecution? You tell me. Yeah. And it's this, Steve. As we know, between the time period of March of 2021 and October 2022, when Paul was arrested at uh, gunpoint by the FBI, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled in the Dobbs against Jackson Women's Health Organization case that Roe v. Wade is uh, no longer the law of the land. Mm -hmm. Abortion is no longer a federal right. So if anything, you would think that the FACE Act should no longer be enforced, certainly not aggressively enforced, 
But instead, exactly the opposite occurred under the Biden DOJ. They weaponized the procedure. They came after folks like Paul that had gone back to his business. By the way, he was never arrested in the first instance for even trespass back in the day because he wasn't sitting in front of a door. And so not only do they bring these aggressive face charges, but for the first time in our nation's history, as far as we can tell, they tag on a felony conspiracy charge in which uh, under which Paul can now uh, face up to 10 years in the federal penitentiary for conspiring to violate the FACE Act. What will it take to stop this, Stephen? Hmm. Great question. <laughs> as Paul reminds us in interview after interview, I think it takes believers, as you all just were uh, discussing, true believers, getting on our faces before a holy God and repenting of our nation's sins. I mean, that's the ultimate issue, isn't it? But in the uh, material realm, we do have two bills introduced, one in the House and one in the Senate in Congress to repeal face. As you know, Steve, politically, that's probably not going anywhere unless we stand up and really put pressure on our lawmakers. Um, and ultimately, we are going to pursue this case to the U.S. Supreme Court, if need be, with arguments that face really is unconstitutional after Roe was reversed and abortion is gone. It really is a preposterous law, never should have been passed in the first place. And now its use is really showing all the world what it was really all about and how unjust it is. If you can get them to hear your case, I think you'll win. The big challenge is getting them to take it. They've, they, I think they, you're exactly they, right. they, they have ducked quite a few. Uh, you know, they yes. ducked another one here today on another matter uh, involving speech codes at Virginia Tech University. So if you yeah. can get them to take your case, you will win it. But the problem that, that we have on the other hand is the other side is, op is fine with openly doing things that may or may not be anti-constitutional just because they want to, and then they kind of dare you to go find a court somewhere that will tell them they can't. You're right. You know, I mean, I, that's yeah. that's a hard right. gambit. Your side won't won't be generous in taking up your cause. The other side will just do whatever the hell they want and say, hey, exactly. if, you can, if you can go find a court somewhere that tells us we can't do that, fine. But until then, we're just going to do whatever the hell we want. That's a, really that's a right. catch-22, yeah. man. Yeah. Agreed. And, you know, if there's anything that characterizes the John Roberts court, it is timidity in taking these hot button cases. As Amy Coney Barrett's concurrence in the Trump uh, uh, ballot access case exhibited, she says, hey, you know, we're not around here to stir up the pot. We've got to tamp things down. Well, the way to tamp things down is not to accept these hot button cases, mm -hmm. which is really to duck your, your ultimate responsibility, mm -hmm. isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Steve, I think that points to the, the character of our nation. I mean, at large, we, the battle is ongoing, and just because Roe's overturned doesn't mean that we're necessarily gaining ground. There's, that's a big hot-button discussion among the Christians today as well. We overturn Roe, and babies are being saved, and that's good, and, and, and certain aspects of the abortion battle is being advanced. There's less gruesome abortion going on. But the reality is this has shifted to chemical and, and medicated abortions a, a while back. And so we still, as, as Christians, we need the heart of the culture. It's not enough just to win in the courts and not just to win in the Congress, mm -hmm. but we still have work to do with our neighbors and we have work to do in our churches and our own personal character. Uh, there's elements of, of maturing our soul and, and drawing near to God and understanding what we need to do in the culture that we live in. And so that's a, that's a big, uh, you know, opportunity here as we see the injustice rise and the courts are doing what the courts do. And like I said, everybody just doing what they want unless they're told they're, you know, somewhere, uh, somebody tells them they can't. Uh, we need to be out there and engaging in this culture and, and engaging in the, the broader conversation uh, with these Christian principles and these ideas, starting with our own self and not casting stones at others, uh, but starting with our own personal character. Amen. Stephen, how can our audience help, if at all? Well, prayer, uh, first and foremost, obviously. Uh, secondarily, to speak out. Steve, your show is a great example of how we, we need to spread the word to folks that aren't going to get this kind of news on the mainstream media, right? Uh, 
And, and then in addition, you can contact Paul Vaughn. Paul, you'll have to leave your uh, website uh, information. But uh, thomasmoresociety.org, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love your prayers and, and uh, support as we move forward. These cases are all over the country. We have another one next month, by the way, Steve, up in Michigan. So be watching in, the, in Detroit. Mm. Identical charges brought against peaceful pro-lifers once again. We go to trial uh, April 11 up there. So the battle continues. Paul, I've got about uh, 30 seconds. Any final words? Yeah, so you can reach out to us at personhoodtn.org as our local website. And I would just encourage the, the people, again, when you see these things, be become educated on these cases. They're easy in the media to, to push them off as radical and outside the bell curve and try to sweep it under the carpet that way. But mm -hmm. Christians need to embrace what's happening and stand up and defend those that are in jail even today from the Washington, D.C. case. There are people in jail uh, for trying to save you know unborn babies. Well, God bless you, Paul, for um, your conviction and your willingness to stand up to the spirit of the age. And uh, Stephen, thank you for uh, fighting for people like him as well. And keep us posted, both of you, on how this goes, okay? Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Really appreciate it. You bet. Gentlemen? What a stark contrast. Like, thinking of the, um, the Palestinian uh, protesters and that hearing up at Congress where uh, Harvard now uh, deposed president and the other two ivy league uh president said yeah i don't know if that's it depends on the context if if uh really you've done any wrong anything wrong when you say hate the jews you know we're beating cops out in the streets we're letting criminals go like the, but the very same people and, and basically to get that harvard girl to step down we had to do like an end around and get capone on tax evasion yes but, but the, was you had to get her on plagiarism, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, all the same people are absolutely certain that this gentleman has to go to jail. It's you, Steve. You can't share a country with these people. I believe somebody you know. Oh, that's you. Has said that. It's just impossible. And Aaron, did you hear what Stephen said? Amy Coney Barrett said, "We're here to dial this down." So one side gets to go to eleven, twenty-eight, yeah. thirty-seven, fifty-nine, six hundred and sixty-six, whenever they want. We have to play within the rules of yeah, institutional we're stuck decorum. Here in this lukewarm hell. And yeah. Make no mistake, it still is hell. This is Exhibit A. This story and the the others like it. And you just heard Stephen uh, Crampton tell tell you there's another one going on up in Michigan uh, very soon. This is Exhibit A in my mind. Why the Jim uh, James Lindsay types don't 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 use the term Christian nationalism. No 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 no. They're gonna round you all up. They're already doing it. Exactly. They've already they made up their their mind ten minutes ago. Walter White. They made up their minds. If you display your faith in public in any meaningful way. You are a Christian nationalist. You're a Christian nationalist. And if they want to, they're going to come after you like they did with Mr. Vaughn. That's the reality here. So, yes, first step is to pray, but understand the enemy here, the opponent. Speaking of understanding the enemy, we're going to try to do that on another front when we come back in hour two. Stay tuned. Back here with Hour 2 Live and On Demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast alongside Aaron McIntyre, Todd Erzin. I am Steve Dace. Don't forget my brand new children's book, book two in my trilogy on America's Christian heritage, Why Easter? Jesus Died for Us So We Can Live Forever. It drops, as they say in the business. In other words, it's out today. You can go to Amazon.com, purchase your copy today of Why Easter. Uh, you can also get a signed copy at premiercollectibles.com slash Why Easter. And then tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern, never done one of these before, so we'll see how it goes. You can join us and uh, leave questions you'd like me to answer as well. We're doing a virtual signing tomorrow. Wednesday, March the 6th at 4 p.m. Eastern at livesigning.com slash why Easter. That's livesigning.com why Easter. And if you buy your book there, now there's very limited. There's only going to be a couple hundred available. If you buy your book there, I can customize how you'd want me to sign it, just like if we were doing an in-person signing. Okay. So livesigning.com slash why Easter. Uh, that's happening tomorrow at 4 p.m. Eastern. Otherwise, go get your copy of why Easter today at amazon.com. Let us all 
also know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Take advantage of that by emailing the program, Steve at SteveDace.com. That's D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, me, we, and Gab. Follow me at Steve Dace Show on Twitter. Get our Instagram and TikTok. And of course, if you like the show, if you're a podcast listener, we always ask, leave us a five-star review and make sure to hit subscribe. Or if you're on iTunes, follow. That way, every time we do a new episode, it will show up in your feed every single time. And thanks to all of you that have done those things for us. Steve Waldman in Jackson, New Jersey, wants to say thank you to Raycon. Hey, thanks for introducing me to Raycon. These earbuds are a game changer. I bought a pair for me and for my very picky son, And we both give it two thumbs up. So that is from Steve Waldman in Jackson, New Jersey. If you want to put Raycon to the test with their outstanding earbuds and everything else they have, amazing quality audio at half the price of other premium audio brands, tens of thousands of five-star reviews, including Steve in New Jersey, who we just shared from, uh, and customizable sound profiles, earbud tap functions, noise isolation, the best I've ever heard in earbuds, by the way, awareness mode, and more. You can't beat it. Just go to buyraycon.com slash Steve today, and they'll slash 20% off your Raycon order if you do that and give you free shipping. That's right, 20% off and free shipping at buyraycon, R-A-Y-C-O-N buyraycon.com slash Steve. That's buyraycon.com slash Steve. Well, some of you might remember I gave the largest individual donation I've ever given to a political candidate to Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson for his 2022 re-election uh, as a way to say thank you uh, for what he has done in, in, in taking a really a sledgehammer to the Overton window on the uh, the experimental COVID mRNA uh, poison pokes. And what he's done on this one issue, I don't, I, I mean, I, it's, it's, it is borderline heroic to me. And we don't, unfortunately, use that term when it comes to politicians very often, but even more uh, scarcely nowadays. So, he recently held a hearing. You're gonna if, if you're watching on Blaze TV, you're gonna see a lot of familiar faces. If you're listening on uh, audio, you're gonna hear a lot of familiar voices from Robert Malone to Pierre Corey and and Jessica Rose. These are all people that have either been on the show or were interviewed in Rise of the Fourth Reich or both. Um, he had uh, really he got these people together for an update on where things stand with the, the, the poison poke and the latest data that's out there. They did about six hours of testimony on this. Governor Johnson, I'm sorry, Senator Johnson's office was kind enough to distill it down to about a 15 minute compilation. I'm going to have us play this entire compilation in its entirety. Because I think as many people as possible need to see this, knowing that we'll get dinged by Facebook for doing this probably. We'll get dinged by YouTube for doing this uh, probably. That's if they're all back on the air. <laughs> if they're all back live and accessible yet. But that's, I don't care. That's, that's how important this information is. And when you, when you hear, or if you're watching, and you, you see what they have to say, you're going to realize why we did this. And then we're going to spend the rest of the hour discussing it. But first, let's hear the evidence in in preparing for this event uh, i was reminded of lewis brandeis's quote in the supreme court decision whitney versus california to quote him if there be a time to expose through discussion the falsehood and fallacies to avert the evil by the processes of education the remedy to be applied is more speech not enforced silence I think that quote is completely applicable to what's been happening over the last three, four years during the pandemic. The title of this hearing is, What Are They Hiding? If we do zoom out and ask, what are they hiding? The answer becomes as obvious as it is disturbing. They are hiding everything. It would be a much shorter committee if it was, what did they not hide? Why are the injured being hidden? These excess deaths are undeniable. Since taxpayers funded the private for-profit research, why don't we have 100% transparency on what we paid for? The COVID-19 pandemic virus exists because it was bioengineered. In most cases, there's been an effort to obscure or deny facts in public communication 
by government and pharmaceutical industry representatives. Independently of whether it's the vaccine or not, as a nation, we should all collectively want to know what is actually causing these tragic health results. However, the silence by the health authorities and the U.S. government strongly suggest they know the answer to that question. In the name of disease control, national security, and the greater good is es escalation of an historic denial of vaccine risks and failures that has become a dangerous assault on freedom of thought, speech, and conscience and poses a grave threat to the biological integrity and natural rights of the people. CDC significantly downplays myocarditis as a side effect of the vaccine. Analysis of the VAERS pharmacovigilance database in the context of the COVID-19 injectable products has revealed strong emergent safety signals from myocarditis to death that are not being acknowledged by the owners of the data. As shot demand wanes, so do the myocarditis reports. What is the actual risk when you add all these potential adverse outcomes together? Further still, how high is the risk when you multiply all of these risks by five doses of the COVID vaccine? Are we still in the ballpark of rare? The SARS-CoV-2 modified mRNA-based vaccine products were deployed via emergency use authorization without adequate non-clinical and clinical testing and without full disclosure of known patient risk and efficacy data. It is nearly impossible to publish data that goes against the national public health narrative. If doctors cannot publish the data, they cannot find solution to fix the problems. What is going on currently is certain governments are now changing how they calculate these numbers. The uh, ONS just announced a change to the calculation methodology for their excess death number, which reduces obviously the excess deaths because they like that result better. For those that control literally public health and, and medicine in general, they, this is the enemy, this is the Achilles heel of the entire pharmaceutical industry. They, they are terrified of repurposed drugs. You will never get a repurposed drug to, uh, to reach uh, regulatory approval if there's uh, more profitable uh, alternatives. I saw that many fake data and even fraudulent articles were published even in the major medical journals. Global policies around COVID-19 vaccines were, of course, uh, dictatorial and discriminatory, leading to the persecution of unvaccinated people, such as myself, and also leading to vaccine injuries. The modified mRNA and adenoviral vectored products employ cutting-edge gene therapy and gene delivery technologies and should be regulated as gene therapy products. It has become clear that the U.S. government, along with the health regulators, do not desire an honest accounting of these policies that were imposed mostly under federal mandates. Each inversion we've witnessed, more so over the past four years, has been executed to precision by a small group hiding inside government and big business. There wouldn't even be a, new, a U.S. newscast without pharma ads. So the reporters on your newscasts are all conflicted. They can't bite the hand that feeds them. Up to 85% of the academic papers, for instance, in the medical field cannot be reproduced and that many of them are, are, uh, are fraudulent. Every single institution dedicated to public truth-seeking is under simultaneous attack. They are all in a state of collapse. This is a death sentence for journalists. It's how you murder a journalist without killing them. It's how you murder a scientist without killing them. It's how you murder a doctor without killing them. It's how you murder the vaccine injured when they haven't died yet. It's how you finish them off and everybody else in their family. We forced the European Union to tell us exactly what was happening with the vaccination during the same day, the day of the vaccination, 12, Thousands of people die the same day, and that should tell something about how criminal this endeavor is. WHO will be given full discretion to set up conditions under which all kinds of mandates, including injections of experimental substances, can be made mandatory on a global scale. If they are adopted, democracy will be sidelined in the event the WHO decides to declare a pandemic. Experts believe the WHO could then, in practice, impose lockdowns and force medical interventions and dictate medical protocols. Right now we're up to almost 37,000 deaths worldwide with the
COVID-19 vaccine, 24.4% of those are occurring on the day of vaccination within one or two days. Yep. And nothing to see here. The censorship we've endured, the gaslighting, the silencing, is unconstitutional. The fact checkers have been continually wrong throughout the last uh, year this has gone on. They initially claimed this could not get into the cells. Um, first they claimed it wasn't there. Now the FDA and the regulators have admitted it's in fact there. Then they claimed it wouldn't get into the cells. We've now shown that in fact that is the case. They knew it was gonna buy, distribute, uh, accumulate in every organ of the body. They knew that the vaccine would not stay in the arm, would not stay localized, and that these inflammatory responses and all the other problems, the DNA, would, would be an issue. Correct. The early death count was hidden. All we're really asking for is just more specificity of what the ingredients are, what's considered an active ingredient, what's considered an inactive ingredient, and nothing more. This is completely non-political. So, so Everybody wants safe drugs. Both the virus origin cover-up and the forced vaccination of the entire planet were orchestrated to protect the integrity of the bioweapons industry. And we have proof of that cover-up from the FOIA documents involving Fauci, Collins, Jeremy Ferrara, and others. We have been ostracized. We, our voice has been silenced. That was a, a censorship campaign that was condoned by the highest levels of government. It was not only condoned at the highest level of governments, it was orchestrated by. Yes. Yes, it was. If the PRR is greater than one, a causal effect is indicated. Fact, the PRR calculation for death from VARES in the context of the COVID-19 shots using current VARES data is 3.6. These products do not deliver natural messenger RNA, but rather a synthetic chemically modified form with extended stability, which causes the body to produce, quote, frame-shifted, unnatural, unintended proteins in addition to the spike protein. Vaccine injury is neither minor nor rare. Note, we were told in 2020 that the COVID-19 risk of death was primar primarily in the older populations. However, in 2021, with the rollout of the quote-unquote safe and effective vaccine, there were approximately another 500,000 excess deaths, but a mix shift had occurred from older to younger. Pharmaceuticals companies are captured by uh, the, the price of the stock. Um, you know, venture capitalists own pharmaceutical companies. They own the CR, the clinical research organizations. They own the site. They own the institutional review board. They own the advertising, the marketing. They influence the, uh, the, through the media. Standard operating procedures for analysis of safety signals emergent from VAERS when utilized reveal causal links between the COVID-19 injectable products and the adverse events investigated. Standard operating procedures are not being followed by the owners of the data, namely CDC, HHS, and FDA, and this equates to hiding the millions of people reporting not only adverse events, but injuries in the context of the COVID-19 injectable products. When a fake uh, information uh, is present in the medical journals, all the public media relay that in the worldwide, but when we publish a counter expertise with the truth, uh, nobody speak about it or they say, oh no, it's just uh, uh, fake information. Pfizer, Moderna, they already knew that there were extra cardiovascular deaths in their own trials. And their excuse was, well, this has nothing to do with the vaccines. First of all, they don't know that. We now know that the vaccines do cause cardiovascular problems. Obviously, the policy cure was undeniably worse than the illness. It's time now for us to stop taking taxpayer funds to slit our own throats. They're trying to take the once powerful human lion and turn us into an easily ruled and easily farmed human lamb. When the news is poisoned, so is democracy, because we've stopped debating about what's right, and instead we waste our time arguing about what's true. Our division is necessary in order to keep us from restoring our capacity to understand and to plot our course in a rational way. The primary job that we have is to rebuild the basic tools that allow us to function as a society. We disguise once again that political interests, political party interests, always trump the public's interest. I believe to the bottom of my heart that this was a great crime against humanity that these companies were uh, doing by promoting and by executing 
this uh, uh, vaccination. Um, and um, unfortunately, it happened, and uh, looking back, we can see what happened. The WHO cannot be trusted at all. It is funded by China, by Big Pharma, and by philanthropists. Uh, philanthropist. I call them oligarchs, by the way. They, there are enormous conflicts of interest. Further amendments threaten free speech and seek to increase censorship of differing opinions, potentially transforming our nation into totalitarian-like states. The COVID-19 injectable products are associated with a 26 and a 100-fold increase in total adverse events and deaths, respectively, when compared per million doses with influenza vaccines in the same time frame. The total excess death since the rollout of the vaccine in the U.S., including 21, 22, and 23, is approximately 1.1 million. We estimate the economic cost of productive working age people dying at 15.6 billion. I see that for every one child that is saved uh, from death, from COVID-19, there are 30 deaths, 30 child deaths associated with the COVID-19 vaccine. So the risk to benefit ratio in, in terms of mortality is 30 to one. And what we saw this pandemic was the price of the stock mattered more than the price of a life. I have many ideological beliefs and I have put them all aside. The defense of the West is paramount, and to the extent that we differ over how society is to be managed in some small way, let's fight about that later. We, we have to save the West. People say that there is nothing in the Constitution that accounts for a pandemic. Oh, yes, there is. It's called the Ninth Amendment. And what does that Ninth Amendment say? The enumeration of the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by whom? The people. Uh, I want to thank all the participants, first of all, for your courage, because I know the very high price you've paid. I understand that. I want to encourage any people, any, any individual working in an agency, working in journalism, working in government, if, if you're seeing something that needs to be exposed, if you want to tell the truth, there's a e email that you can use, whistleblower at ronjohnson.senate.gov, where you can blow the whistle. That's what we need. We need more patriots understanding the threat, the danger our nation faces because of the misinformation, the disinformation, the malinformation, not coming from the dissidents, but from our government, from our elite, that has put this country on a very dangerous path. I think that is one of the, uh, the most incredible 15 minutes of video we've ever shown on the show. So let's get some reaction. Todd, I'll start with you. Uh, I mean, I'm incredibly uh, proud. Just, I'll say, sometimes I just have to say things that Steve can't. From the beginning of this genre with Rush Limbaugh till now. You can talk about any other issue on, any other show you want, any other medium, whatever. But what this show did on this issue stands second to none in the history of this medium. You know already half of those people because they've been on this show or they've been in uh, one of Steve's two books on this. And we started doing this. This is uniquely about the jab, but it's all a kiss and cousin to everything from the very beginning in March 2020. And we know it goes beyond that, the very least in terms of where this uh, knowing the virus was around and, and uh 2019 beyond that when fauci got involved in this we know i'm proud never before and i mean this no rhetorical flourish never before and as nebula it's 2024 now i'm thank god this is getting done but thank god like you know how this happened the, the retired Hall of Fame Green Bay Packer left tackle, the Packer Hall of Fame, Ken Rutgers' wife got injured by it, and he calls up Ron Johnson. 
and that snowball starts getting momentum. But we, we, what we tried to do desperately from the very beginning of this is just like everybody, you're joining a cult. Thank God this has come into light. But I, I just, it, this needs to be said. Well, we'll never, no matter what we do, as long as you keep doing this, Steve, you've, we've been telling you this for years and years and years from the very beginning at, at yes, at, 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 at personal cost in terms of, uh, if, as Steve said from the beginning, if, if we were wrong, it was game over. We weren't wrong. And we've been trying to tell you. And it's time everybody get on board this bandwagon. Some band, most bandwagons suck. You got to get on this one. Because as Mr. Uh, Dr. Weinstein said, he, the things he's put aside, is Steve, I, I wasn't familiar with him. He's a man of the left, roughly mm -hmm. speaking, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, he, do you understand? There's not going to be any cute little argument between left or right, whatever the issue was, if you allow this to stand. For four years now, on this show, the Steve Day Show, we've been doing this. Again, I'm damn proud. Aaron? I'm at the place where Todd has described himself being at before, where you're trying to find a new and effective way of saying some of the same things that you've said ad nauseum for, for several years. And I can't. And it's because if you really understand, if you really listen with fresh ears as much as you can, and if you've been listening to this show, it, it may be hard to do, but if you could transport yourself and listen to what you just heard with fresh ears, you would be speechless. Mm -hmm. If you were transported back just even five years ago, ten years ago, and without any context, you listened to what you just heard for the last 15 minutes, your reaction would be, my country's about to commit suicide, or at least get hell-bent on, on uh, an entire civilization is going to try at their darndest to commit suicide. That's basically what you heard spelled out there. From experts ranging from liberal academia in the United States to politicians and I think, uh, what is it, Robert, uh, Rob Roos in, um, in, in the Netherlands, in the I think. Netherlands, yeah. Spanning really all of the West. He's a, min he's a minister of parliament there. Correct, yeah. It's, it's, it's one of those It was Denmark or the Netherlands. Yeah, somewhere yeah. there, yeah. You, you, you would be speechless if you listened to that just 10 years ago, but it really happened and these conversations are really happening. But what room are they? <laughs> A Senate hearing room. Everybody's, everybody, even those who were affected by it, everybody is so, so ready, seemingly, to, to, to just move on and pretend like this didn't happen, but it did. It really did. And at some point, whether it's, whether it's resignation or whether it's just, um, you know, whether it's just beating the dead horse, I think a lot of us have a propensity to become numb to the evils that were foisted upon all of us for the last few years. Mm -hmm. We must not do that. We must not. Now, actually now, more than any other time, while they're still somewhat fresh in our minds, now is the time to strike. I, I hope, I, I don't know, I... <laughs> grasping at straws here. <laughs> Go back to the, the clip of Dr. Phil last week on The View, where he talks about all of the damage that was done to the people who were least likely to be negatively impacted by the virus itself. The damage was greatest to them, the school children. And you heard the audience of The View of all places cheering for that. I, I hope that's indicative that there's some sort of appetite for accountability for what happened, but I'm skeptical. It is heartening, though, to know that there are a lot of people, and you just heard all of them, a lot of people who are still not letting this go. People with platforms, people with great pedigrees who are not letting this go. You addressed it. I was going to bring it up anyway. Brett Weinstein's comment that we have to set aside our ideological differences to save the West. 
agree with that or not and and what would that look like what would that look like thoughts well, well so, science is not supposed <clears throat> to be by definition ideologically captured it's just it's just that's what empiricism is it's mm-hmm. just, here it is the material in front of me the terra firma i'm not I, and there is a, I mean, we used to debate in science about, you know, you, gosh, you can't even, it's so hard because just by the the very nature of observing something in the experiment, you're, you're not coming into it as a tabula, you know, it's not a tabula rasa. You're, you're imparting something no matter what. People used to think like that, try to pull back as much as possible. That's what what he's what he's saying is just to hearken back to that, not pretending it it's it, this isn't it was never a religion it was quite frankly it was the opposite we took that too far. Yeah, I it would it would look like Steve what's been done in the past, it would look like not being damn fools and pretending that science uh, and faith and reason didn't all work together to create many many great things including hospitals and medicine and experimentation including the west yes including the west all of it right there this this whole thing he, i mean he doesn't even go far enough we, correct we, we yes we actually have to put aside our differences in order to save the west but go further do we deserve yeah to go on as the west if we won't if we if this is what we want to be we are something other than what the west has always been we're we we have way more to do with hitler than we do with anything else and the final solution that's why we called it rise of the force fourth wreck I, I understand what brett weinstein is is communicating or trying to communicate there Unfortunately, I believe it's a non sequitur. It would have made sense in the 80s and 90s, something like that. And there were more shared fundamental values. Correct. Yeah. But it's it's a non sequitur now. The because it, it's a non sequitur because anything short of we are up against a cult here. We're up against a cult at every single level of every institution, pretty much in the West. That changes the calculus for what must be done and how to do it. Merely putting aside ideological differences, again, sounds great. Three or four decades ago, it's not sufficient for the moment in which we live. And unfortunately, the secular voices you hear in that video, I'm not sure they have the eyes to see that. All right, when we come back, there's a there's an angle I want I want to take to what we just discussed and what you just saw that I think our show is uniquely equipped to tackle. So we're going to next. Well, you look for silver linings when you go through what we have the last few years via COVID stand and the pandemic, the scandemic. One of them, folks like Jace Medical stepped into the breach for people. I mean, they, they saw what was going on with venerable medications that were uh, celebrated for decades and are it were given major awards, including Nobel Prizes, and were now being told that they were dangerous just when they maybe might be needed the most and they wanted to make sure that couldn't happen again so they came up with this product the jace case and now they've expanded it so you can still get the traditional jace case if you want with the five venerable antibiotics in there but you can now customize it for many other medications as well based on what you need or what what your loved one needs to make sure the next time there's a so-called emergency this time you're in control of your fate and not the spirit of the age. And yes, you can put ivermectin in your Jace case if you want. Just saying. JaceMedical.com is where you can go to get the Jace case, and you should. J-A-S-E, JaceMedical.com. Enter the code DACE at checkout for a discount on your order. Discount code is my last name, DACE, D-E-A-C-E, at J-A-S-E, JaceMedical.com. JaceMedical.com. Discount code is DACE on your order. 
So we have, a, I think, one of the more unique listener-viewer coalitions, really maybe in the media in the country, on this show, because of the work that we did during COVID. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen estimates that our audience grew anywhere from 400 to 600% as a result of the the work that, you know, being on the tip of the sphere, uh, tip of the spear, I should say, when it comes to COVID. Um, and so I, I think that we have, an, we have an audience that is, has a very, I think, broad perspective on some things that maybe other audiences on our side right now aren't willing to entertain. If you know what I'm saying, just because the, the maybe the galvanizing thing that brought that audience together was just as an example, a shared support for Donald Trump and and what you thought he represented as a as a as something new, a fresh voice, a disruptor to the system, right? So, like if you're if if you're somebody like Candace Owens, for example, nobody knew what a Candace Owens was prior to Trump. No one had ever heard the name in their lives. Now she's one of the biggest names in our industry. I would imagine since that was kind of what made her bones, that audience probably is not inclined all that often to, well, let's, you know, take a more critical or skeptical view of things where Mr. Trump is concerned. Just, that's just fair, right? Like, you know, um, I had to learn how to build a sports talk radio audience in Iowa when I first started out, despite not growing up here and giving a rip about neither Iowa or Iowa State, in fact. <laughs> okay. So, you know, if, in the end, you know, people want to listen to people that care about the same things that they do. Our audience has largely been built a different way. I mean, the galvanizing moment, the critical mass moment for this show was what you just articulated, Todd, the work that we did with COVID. We had a base audience before that, otherwise we wouldn't have been on a platform of this magnitude, but the growth of this audience was built on pursuit of data, pursuit of critical thinking, um, entertaining ideas that maybe we don't even agree with, but to be willing to scrutinize them and scrutinize ourselves, right? Okay. And so because of that, I think we might be, we might be the largest show capable of having this conversation for the next few minutes. I absolutely believe, I'm speaking for me now, I, and I've said this all along. I said this when Ron DeSantis is in the race, and it was, I thought it was true then. I said it before he got in the race. I'll say now that he's no longer in the race, and the race is basically over. I, I absolutely believe we cannot afford four more years of these people in charge. And, and I just go to the interview we just did last hour. I mean, that Christian family man with 11 kids... His odds of whether or not he's going to jail may largely hinge on two factors. Well, we're talking earthly factors. Obviously, we serve a sovereign God. But we're, we're talking about what we see in the natural realm or the, hidden, the, scene, realm, the, the scene realm. They hinge on two factors. The, the legal capability of his attorneys and the Thomas More Society, by the way, has an, has an exquisite reputation on our side. But then the, the standing that they'll be able to even get to make their arguments, which we discussed with the attorney right an hour ago. The other is this election. I mean, if Donald Trump's people are running the Department of Justice, you think Paul's probably fighting for his life, his freedom? Odds are less. Yeah. Dramatically less, don't you think? I hope so. Yeah. I, it, what about, let's get closer to home, our own very own Steve Baker, Yeah. for example. Dramatically less. So, so those are real world consequences. Th th those go beyond my team, my quarterback, or Fox News is more fun, or, you know, I, the jollies that my guy that won, or um, any personal, ego, you know, ego I get out of it. We're talking real world practical consequences here, right? Yeah. But this works the other way, too. Because I, I hear from those of you who, who agree with me on that in this audience all the time. But I hear from another group in this audience, too. And maybe this might be the only audience in America where these two camps are camped out and listening and watching the same show. There's another audience out there. My loved one is never coming home. 
my kids never recovered from the lockdowns. My grandmother, grandfather died alone in a nursing home. My best friend didn't, uh, didn't get to go to a celebrate recovery group with the churches shut down. So he killed himself. How many of these have I received and am still receiving? The answer, Alexa, is a lot. And those people are like, hey, we gave this guy a chance. There were real world consequences to his decisions and we're still suffering from them. My career is over, lost my company, closed up, never coming back. I lost my military rank, commission, pension, everything, because I wouldn't let him poison me. My career, you know, I was a decorated soldier, gone. I lost my baby. I'm infertile. These are all things we have seen and witnessed with our own eyes and heard with our own ears, correct? Oh, yeah. I, I, I co-wrote a book of 400 pages of stories like this, and we barely scratched the surface. And meanwhile, Donald Trump says uh, he doesn't think he gets enough credit for all the good that he does on this Correct. Front. The irony here is that it is, it is the people, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene held similar conversations in the House recently to not quite as extensive as Ron Johnson did, but some similar conversations. Mm-hmm. Marjorie, no one would know what a Marjorie Taylor Greene was with, without Donald Trump, right? Right. She has, she, that's her meal ticket, okay? Um, Ron Johnson aside, by and large on the right, which camp is more likely to entertain the conversation that we just showed this audience? The, the people most fanatical about Donald Trump or the people the least fanatical about Donald Trump on the right? the people the most fanatical are yes the people least fanatical are the ones that are uh you guys are anti-vaxxers and uh you know tell dr joe latipo to stop the measles outbreak in florida that's them right yes okay yeah that's nikki haley doing events you know campaign events a couple of years ago where you had to be jabbed to get in stuff yes. like that right so there's this strange disconnect where the the people that are on our side that are the most likely to pursue truth in this area by and large, you know, Ron Johnson's not a traditional MAGA guy. He was in office before any of this happened, okay? But he's, again, that's an exception. Rand Paul, again, he's been willing to entertain some of this. He was in office before MAGA became a brand. But by and large, especially within media platforms on the right, by and large, the more MAGA you are, the more willing you are, uh, if you're on the right, to entertain this conversation fair yes it's a, as a general rule there's yes. always exceptions but as a general rule that's true yes and yet and so there's this strange disconnect where that is true and yet they're aligned closely with the figure who wrote all these checks still brags about it to this day et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. and and so you know I, i've seen surveys one out of seven florida voters are saying that the republicans are saying they'll never vote for trump how many of that is driven by this it's certainly a factor. Huge factor. Yeah. And is there a way to bring these two groups together? I think about what Brett Weinstein said last segment. To set some ideological things aside to save the West. Forget Trump. I, he, he's, he's a figurehead. And you're dealing with ego and and he wouldn't be the first man to not want to admit a a, a cosmic failure like this. So forget about him for a minute. But if there's any show that has done more or better work with with a larger audience than ours on this shot the last few years, it is Steve Bannon's fair. I mean, Steve Bannon and Naomi Wolf are basically, uh, you know, tied at the hip on this stuff. So let's talk about those folks because they're going to be here long after Trump's off the national stage. The politicians come and they go. It's the people in our spots that tend to hang around and linger before and after they came and went. What if that group messaged this differently? What if they simply said, 
on a consistent basis. This is a terrible blind spot for the president. It's his biggest failure. He'd be better off if he admitted it. We need to do everything we can to help these people. Meaning they just showed more empathy. Rather than... Um, if, if, if you can't let your own suffering go, you're some kind of traitor who's helping Joe Biden win. And I wonder if the, but this is now where Trump comes back into the conversation and I'm, I'm not involved enough in that, not nearly enough. I, I, I mean, I know a few people who are, but it'd be secondhand hearsay. I wonder if you're not permitted the level of access that people like Bannon get and approval and, and by, by, by the Godfather over there. I wonder if you're not granted that opportunity of nuance. I wonder if he just doesn't permit that in his midst, that, that essentially we're kind of talking about a boy king like character from the Game of Thrones. Okay. What was that kid's name? The blonde haired kid. Do you remember yeah, him? I, I okay. just don't remember. That you name. essentially everything. Joffrey? Joffrey. It? Yes. That, uh, that you essentially everything has to be, you're the greatest ever. And that you're not, you're not permitted any level of nuance that you, you know, we always joke about people dividing themselves up the Southern Baptist convention and others dividing themselves up between absolute Trump and never Trump and how both of these are roads to nowhere and idolatrous paths. Maybe Trump himself does this. Maybe that's how he sees the world. You're hundred percent with me at all times or you're never with me. Your own conscience isn't permitted. And I only ask that because we don't see any evidence of this. Like there's, there's never, a, there's, there's never any empathy expressed to people who just like to know, do you see me? Do you hear me? Do you, do you understand what's happened to me, happening to me, to people I care about? And yeah, you know, there's a, it, it's a big election. There's, a, there's other big issues. This isn't the only one, but why do you make me feel like I'm a terrible person? Because I want my pain acknowledged. Does, it, does that make me a terrible person? No. Am I rambling or is, am I going anywhere with what I'm trying to point out here? You're going somewhere, but... We, is it a place this, that this is... This is not a new problem. Is it a place that is possible to arrive at? I don't think so. You don't? Which is why I wanted you to get your gun out in the middle of that. Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, you can't put... You, I understand why you did just for a second to make a point but I, you can't you can't put trump aside trump never gives these a lot of these people the permission to entertain it because he simply won't and and the, and it's in the fate that look at how many villains there are in this this is like we, we we we've been in help me help you territory with donald trump before on this one he could, he's he isn't a doctor he is, he he is juggling every president is juggling chainsaws on some level like he took a lot of advice and he kept taking it and he kept taking but at least he could reframe this as you all lied to me you sobs and now you're gonna pay for it mm -hmm. and i'm gonna bring you down he he could do it he could and not just because of this for a long time but he didn't fire fauci he just won't he is, in many ways, and remains to this day, completely paralyzed by COVID in, in, in a number of ways. Um, whether it was the advice in the early days, you know, uh, try to take off your whatever tinted glasses as much as you can, uh, th see things just as objectively as we possibly can, forget the name Donald Trump. Hell, if, if Ron DeSantis or a Ted Cruz or a Thomas Massey or a Rand Paul were president in February and March of 2020, they would have faced some of the, they would have faced the exact same things that Donald mm -hmm. Trump faced. 
And that when you're the leader of uh, a country like the United States, that's scary. That, that is scary. You, you, you don't know whether or not you're making, but eventually you have to be the one with whom the buck stops. And he could never get out of that paralysis. And that's why he's paralyzed to this day. On the one hand, I'm sure there's some instinct within his orbit to do what Todd was saying, reframe the in- issue. But on the other hand, I'm sure within Trump's immediate orbit, there's also the fear of liability. What if they turn this around on me? So he's paralyzed. So we're asking in this conversation for something I just do not believe, I don't believe can hmm. happen. First email I received, and I've gotten a ton since we played that video. First email I received was this one from Michael Wells. How do we get Trump to see this 15 minute video? And you can almost just like, when you read his email, you can almost like sense the pleading spirit that he wrote this with, right? I, I wish I knew. I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that question. I'm not wired to let people around me get away with these kinds of disconnects. That's why I'm not in usually involved in movements like that. I'm not the guy you ask to join them because I'm the guy that will question things. Even if, even if I agree with you, I'll just question things just to make sure we're not all, you know, smelling each other's farts, basically. So I, I don't know how you penetrate that bubble. I don't. Romans 828.